Hi, this is Robert Shearer with another edition of Shearer Intelligence, where I hasten to say the intelligence comes from my guests, in this case, uh, Marie uh, Arana, and um, a great pedigree. Uh, but I, I, I want to say at this stage of my life, I basically only do books. Uh, first of all, I read them, <laughs> and, and which maybe is unusual in what remains of the book reviewing industry. And I only do books that I actually think people should read and, and take seriously. So, uh, I, and this is a, a book that I'm unabashedly enthusiastic about. So, uh, I, but it raises many, many questions. Uh, the book, I, let me get the title in, is Latino Land. It's Simon & Schuster. It came out, I think, last week. And uh, it's a portrait of America's largest and least understood minority. And, uh, you know, living in L.A. and so forth, uh, we don't think of Latinos as the uh, as a minority. Uh, we think of this as the dominant culture here uh, correctly and, and, uh, and uh, as a positive thing. But what your book does, let's just begin right off the top. Uh, you present a very complex portrait uh, and the power of it is in the complexity. Uh, and you even question your own title. What is Latino land? What is a, a Latino, Latinx, Latina, et cetera. But what comes across very clearly is we're talking about a, 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 a population, however it's described, and does it, it's still not clear whether it includes Brazil and Portuguese, but Spanish is the sort of uh, the language of the colonizer is the unifier. Uh, you, in your own case, you come from Peru. You were six years old the first time you visited the United States. You had a Peruvian father, and I gather a very typical WASP American mother from where Wyoming or someplace. Uh, Hi. Hi. Wyoming, yes. and then nine. Uh, then later, you end up at the Miami airport, and you don't know quite, but you're now going to stay here. And you go on, let me just put your credentials right out there. You go on to really a, a illustrious career. You end up being a very famous uh, columnist about books and books related for the Washington Post. You were the book review editor. And the title I love most of all uh, is the uh, literary, wait, wait, tell me again, the inaugural, um, literary, inaugural literary director. Literary yeah. director. Of, of, of the Library of Congress. I can't think of a more impressive title. And you've written some really important books. Before I got this book, I read American Chica, which is really your own journey, and it's a marvelous story. And I, But there's something so powerful about this book, because it, it embraces complexity. Who are we talking about? We're talking about people like you with different background. Uh, are we talking about indigenous people? Are we talking a Spanish colonialist, or the dominant mixed uh, breed of a whole new creation, really? And, and so what we can lose in this complexity is a sense there is a people here. That's the power of this book. Uh, like it or not, a, a distinct population, uh, even though I just happened to be at a, a great Mexican restaurant here with the best chef in L.A. last night, and he said, well, you know, I was always raised to uh, be prejudiced against people like m me who are mixed up, uh, you know, uh, but uh, white people, and that's still true, you know, and so we had one of those kind of restaurant conversations that I talked about your book and that I was going to do it. So, there's no denial of the complexity and what title and what should you call people and so forth. On the other hand, there's no denial that a people has emerged from this, you know, uh, almost like any other diaspora living group, uh, beginning with the indigenous. And they are a force to be reckoned with. And they have some common points of identity. And I think, I don't want to uh, mistake this, but I get the feeling there is a sense of exploitation, of anti-colonialism, of uh, take us seriously, pride at the heart of it. So maybe we should begin with that. Uh, what, what is that Absolutely. basic Absolutely. unifying idea? Yeah, you know, it, it, when we come to the United States, and you know, I, I have to say, I'm saying when we come, but we have always been here. We have always been here. People don't realize 
that. And that was an important mission of my book is to tell the, the history, really, of the, of the Latino people in this country, which goes all the way back, of course, to pre-Columbian times, um, because so many of us are a mix of indigenous and uh, European and African and Asian. And we are a, a great mix. And as you say so, so well, Bob, um, the complexity, the diversity is huge. There is inclusivity uh, in, the, in the name of, La, of a Latino. I mean, we, are, uh, we begin with inclusivity because our races are so mixed. When, uh, when uh, Latin America was formed by the conquest, the Spanish conquest, uh, in this hemisphere, uh, it was an, an incredible experiment in itself. I mean, it was an experiment of race mixing that had never been done on this planet before in, in um, recorded time. So, so start with that. Um, we, we are diverse in ourselves, but then we come here and we are uh, Peruvian Americans or Cuban Americans or Mexican Americans or um, those, and, and Mexican Americans have been here since before, uh, actually the uh, way before the um, pilgrims landed on, in Providence in Massachusetts. So this is a population that is um, diverse in itself, mixed in itself. Uh, even the Spanish, when they arrived, had been mixed for eight centuries with the Moors and the Jews. So we, we represent a race mixing that um, is really unequal uh, and, and the rest of this earth. But uh, when we come, we come as these separate quantities because the one thing that Spanish colonialism did was to separate us and keep us conquered by uh, not allowing us to communicate with, with one another. So the vice royalty of Argentina did not communicate with the vice royalty of of Peru, did, which did not communicate with the vice royalty of New Spain, which was Mexico, and that was forbidden. So we didn't really know each other as a unit. Um, what Simon Bolivar, who was the, the um, liberator of six republics, did was create this idea, if we only all got together, we would be one of the most powerful forces on earth. If we created Latin America from all these separate republics. That never happened, but it sort of happened here in the United States when all of these uh, groups came uh, up and it happened in, in our lifetime, Bob. It happened in our lifetime. I remember when I arrived at the age of 10, there were recorded on the US census 2 million Latinos in this country, 2 million. Tell us um, when we caught more. I, I just, sorry to interrupt, but when you arrived in Miami, uh, I, I don't remember the exact year, but the bathrooms were still racially segregated and you didn't know which one to go to. Uh, exactly. That's a powerful opening because, you know, in a great American celebration, you know, is it Donald Trump, America, I'm going to make America great again? Or is it Hillary Clinton, we've always been great? Uh, your book is right at the beginning there are many other reminders of uh, another side of the story, but you arrived in, in a segregated America. What year was that? Well, I was slapped with that reality from the very beginning because, yeah, I mean, you arrive and we were in a bus station headed west to, to visit my, uh, my American grandparents in Wyoming. And um, there in the bus station, it was the whites only bathroom and then the colored bathrooms. And uh, I was hit with this reality right away. Um, it's so binary, so un-nuanced, you know, where you had to choose between one or the other. And uh, I didn't know what color I was, you know. Um, and in fact, my, my DNA shows that I am uh, black and indigenous and white and Asian. So I am all the things that Latinos can be. Um, and I just remember uh, being confused by by that binary system. And it is a confusion that has lasted, uh, I think since then to now, because uh, we are the hardest ethnicity to record uh, on the US census because we are so many types. I mean, the Dominicans and the Puerto Ricans are heavily mixed with black. The Cubans who are here, the Cubans are, are largely black now in the, um, on the island 
of Cuba, but the Cubans who are here are largely white, who, you know, the exodus of whites from the island. Um, and then the Mexican Americans, the Central Americans are uh, mixed with indigenous, and it's a very different sort of thing. But what I was going to say was when uh, I came, there were 2 million recorded Latinos in this country. Today, there are 64 million. So imagine in the course of my lifetime going from 2 million to 64 million. Um, and it has been a, uh, a, 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 a part of this country that is undeniable. Um, and as I say, it has been here since the very beginning because, um, uh, of course, the United States pushed in to Mexico. It, the, all the lands that we're sitting on now, I'm in San Diego, you're in Los Angeles, um, all the way to Colorado, all the way to, um, to Ka Kansas, that whole area was Mexican. And uh, the United States pushed into it just, you know, in a sort of happy-go-lucky way. Uh, President James Polk said, go take your stick and go put it in the ground and that's your land and we're going to spread this country all the way to the... You, you actually the have a chapter uh, that I, the phrase in it, uh, the border crossed me, I didn't cross the border, which I first heard from Dolores Huerta, who I met when she was still, was a farm worker organizing uh, person right. and her family, literally the border crossed them uh, yes. and, and uh, that slogan. Uh, I, I want to go back to the history a little. Th this is uh, interesting because you are obviously an accepted establishment thinker. I'm not putting you down, but you, you know, you're not some <laughs> wild radical. Uh, you mentioned the Brown Berets. I knew some of those folks back in, in L.A. in the old days and people searching for, you know, you're and you're, half of you anyway comes from American as apple pie, for better or worse or what have you. But. Your book, I happened to go to Christopher Columbus High School in the Bronx, <laughs> by no means an exceptional school, doesn't even exist anymore. But we did have the honor of a prominent place in the Columbus Day Parade going down through Manhattan. I think it was 50 Avenue, I'm not sure. And I would be marching this parade for those years and so forth. And frankly, you know, was raised with the idea that you know, Columbus, I thought, you know, that's sort of respecting my Italian classmates. Uh, but, you know, how could anybody be against Columbus? And this gets into something very provocative about your book. Uh, who owns the narrative? And what right do we have to question the narrative? And the reason I bring up your establishment credentials is because it's so refreshing that you embrace an alternative or alternative narratives there, there are many. And it begins, for me, in your book with Columbus. And you yeah. point out, uh, in, you know, if you take the period from 1492 to 1612, you call it the great dying. And, and, yeah. and what it is, is, a, a, as you say, a genocide of historic proportions. And the indigenous population goes from being 60 million to 6 million, the combination of disease and murder. But one of the interesting things about it, it uh, you just mentioned that Spanish didn't permit communication between different people, except sexually. And, right. and, and in your book, that really, that whole period of, of the Spanish conquest and first, is really the great rape. It is, in fact, a systematic sexual exploitation of the indigenous population, a few who even could get married but that was not the norm, as, as you point about. So if you think in biblical terms, I mean, what is this? This is uh, this whole thing that we celebrate now as the center of civilization. Uh, some, some celebrate it. Uh, the fact is it was born in the most horrific of circumstance. Uh, and you don't mince words in this book. No. And you document it, you go through it. So why don't we, we begin with that? Because that's a reckoning, you know, uh, and uh, let me just throw another little caveat there. It you, is also a result of slavery. And you have an interesting statistic in your book. Uh, you say, I think if I got the numbers right, yes, a million slaves were brought to what is now the United States, or, you know, to, to be agriculture. But I think your figure is 13 million or 12 million were brought to oh. Latino land. Yeah. And 
Well, 12, 12 million were brought in the Atlantic slave oh. trade. So 12 million Africans were abducted from their homes, put on slave ships, and uh, in the, gal in the what it was called, the hold of the uh, slave ships in chains, and brought over 350,000 went to the United States. All the rest, 11 plus, 11 million plus, all went to Latin America and the Caribbean. So um, it, we have the preponderance in the Latin world of the African slave market, uh, the African slave trade. It's phenomenal, uh, the, the, the race mixing. And as you say, the, the raping really of the indigenous because uh, for all the glory of being the ethnicity that holds so many races, that holds all the races of man, it came from a absolutely disastrous and chaotic past. Um, a brutality, the, uh, though, the brutality. The, the, these women, the indigenous women, uh, were just available, had no rights, no way of protecting themselves. I mean, I, I you know, because people get tired. Oh, don't bring up history. Don't bring up the past. Don't talk about reparations. Don't talk. Well, that's utter nonsense. That's like saying don't. You know, forget about the Holocaust or the Armenian genocide. No, no, right. you can't forget about it. And in fact, the very reason we're having difficulty defining what is this peoplehood you're talking about is precisely, I mean, the main instrument of destroying any unique sense of peoplehood was rape. Yes, I'm, I'm not, yes it was. I want to be careful. I'm not grafting this onto your book. This is basic. This is a, a scream at the beginning of your book. Right, right. Very much so, because, I mean, that's the reality. That's the history. I mean, you have to look at it squarely in the eye. Um, and uh, even if we have become, uh, you know, a, a great and glorious population that has achieved a lot, we have to realize what our past was and, and, and um, factor it. In, uh, in, in the whole story. And we can't ignore it. We can't ignore it because it's there. Um, and it is there now in ways that um, we couldn't have imagined if we had lived in those times. Uh, it is there now with um, a, a very racist and a very str uh, stratified uh, Latin America. Because don't... That's been no words about it. The white elites, the people who can say that they're pure Europeans, are still the top of the top dogs in, in Latin America. And they're the ones who rule, and they're the ones who have the money, and they're the ones who have the haciendas. And then there's a whole stratification, of course. Um, but what you can say about us is that there was no hesitation to intermarry it. The, um, what Isabella then discovered when all of this business of the mistreatment, the brutality against the indigenous happened. And she being a very good Catholic lady said, uh, well, we have to stop this. We have to, we have to completely stop this. So she, they began then to come with their white wives, the, 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 the people, the, the Spanish who began to populate. But until then, I mean, there were, we were talking about hundreds of years and then just the natural um, there was so much population to mix with. Interestingly enough, Bob, today in the United States of America, we are the ethnicity that most intermarries. So a Hispanic will intermarry with a black, will intermarry with a white, will intermarry with an Asian. We have um, the most proclivity to intermarry in general of any ethnicity in this country. So that has carried through as well, that sense of, yeah, it's all right. It's okay to mix. It's not, uh, you know, we we are so mixed ourselves. Why not? Um, so that still lives. But uh, but you are absolutely right. We cannot ignore that history. That history is blatant and clear and lives in us. Well, and as you pointed out, even with migration, it's reflected. I, not Again, not to drop names here or anything, but I once interviewed Fidel Castro about this. And uh, uh -huh. uh, he came from the white elite, and and right. Cuba, I think, roughly could be a, a then described as one third white, one third mixed, and then one third black. And he was and Che Guevara, they were very conscious of it. And yet, when they got involved with Africa, where they basically, 
I mean, m- m- many people would say played a progressive role. I mean, they seem to be on the side of some uh, resistance to apartheid and uh, racism. Nonetheless, Harry, what are you doing in, in Africa? And, and Fidel Castro's answer was, this is the unresolved issue of Cuba and the rest of uh, Latin America race. And we have to come to grips with it. And, uh, uh, and, and um, you know, um, I, I, there's another person I want to drop the name. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, you, you mentioned, he says, we have to recognize, I wrote it down, uh, Carlos Fuentes, uh, I think was, right? You quote him. Uh, yeah. Yes, and yes. Uh, yeah, Carlos Fuentes says, when we understand that none of us is pure, I forget the rest of the sentence, but then we will un- understand this. And so this struggle over, you know, what is race and what is the significance of skin color is very critical to how you, it, relatively easy it was to divide and conquer this whole people. And and so that's the only reason I mentioned the Castro thing. I mean, I think throughout Latin America, this question of how are you going to deal with race and the indigenous because I know, like in the United States, we take we have a pretty good accounting now of indigenous people. What happened in Mexico? They don't have that sort of thing. Uh, and yet, as as you point out, uh, if we think about uh, uh, genocide, going from sixty million people living in relative harmony and caring about the environment, one thing you can say about the indigenous population, they were pretty good at handling nature. And existing, right. and and yeah. you slaughter, or through your import of disease and violence and rape and everything else, you reduce it from sixty million to six million. Is that a contested figure, or that's one we? Some would some would say it was greater, from a hundred oh. million. So, I mean, the uh, people assume that um, when Christopher Columbus landed and then, and then the rest of the, uh, the Spanish conquistadors came, that there were very few people in this hemisphere. In fact, it was percolating with people, the populations of all the tribes. And there were, there were um, you know, thousands of, of tribes of people and, and all of uh, a very uh, sort of lively population and throughout the hemisphere. Um, and, and yeah, and those people, some people, some historians say that it was as large as 100 or 110 million in this hemisphere. The conservative figure is 60 million, and it was reduced to, to um, just a few million, which is extraordinary, really, by, by disease, um, by uh, genocide, by simple massacres, uh, and by the slave trade, because People were uprooted from their homes to be sent to the mines, um, and whole families were divided. And uh, the mining extraction became the whole story. I mean, getting the gold and the silver and the copper. And um, look, Bob, it's still the same. It's still the same. Uh, today, the, the biggest, most considered the biggest business in Latin America is the mining. And um, and you see it still that obsession with extraction, where where the the resources and the goods are taken and removed and sent away, and very little of the profits and the progress stay within the countries that actually, you know, sit on the minerals. So it's um it, it's it, it's a long and very dramatic. Story. Yeah, you're a brilliant uh, writer. I mean, and I'm not stoking you. I mean, it's a, it, I just want to be clear. It's a joy to read. And fortunately, it's not some thousand page tome. I'm not putting down all thousand page, 1500 page books, but I've been doing this show now for about six years. And yours is a, a pleasure uh, to read. But but I, I, I wonder about Look, okay, let me put my own view because we're going to run out of time. I think people should buy this book, read it, but I also think it should be required. Uh, it should be required as part of any education. I happen to teach at a college, a USC, but uh, it should come earlier. And And the reason I think it should be required is that your very insistence on two things, as I mentioned before, the complexity but then people take the complexity as an excuse 
to ignore a problem because they say, oh, there's no such people. What is an African-American? What is a Latino? What is this? What is that? They're just arguing about labels or they're trying to grab labels. No, you make a forceful argument throughout this book that there is a people here. There's a people. And you yes. cannot deny it's a yes. people. Complex, varied, not always in agreement. Some are Democrats, some are Republicans, some like this, some uh, reject the Catholic Church, some embrace it. You know, you go through all the complexities on every page, beginning with your own family. Complex, you know, and uh, why you stand out in this little mining village. Talk about mining. Your father was involved in that activity. You are the odd duck. The American Seeker, which I thought was a very powerful book. You mentioned uh, some Bolivia. You know, you wrote that book. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But as a book person, I sometimes wonder, what are we doing here? Does anybody buy books? Does anybody read books? Uh, and I did want to tap into a little bit, you know, yes, this is a very important book. And I, th I think you've spent a lot of time writing it. I don't know why, but I get 10 years is sticking out in my mind. And I do want to assure people, you, you're not going to have to spend a lot of time reading it. Uh, you know, I've read it now twice and uh, it, it's a joy to read. And yes, uh, but and you could make a movie over lots of it. I'd love to see a revisit of the whole uh, Columbus legacy. I think we're long overdue. But uh, I want to ask you as a professional a major figure in the book world, uh is this book being well received well? Are you going to get it out there? Uh, is there a reason to write books? Uh... Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely, there's a reason to write books. I've spent my whole life in books, uh, working for publishers, working on the critical side in the Washington Post, and then, and then writing them myself. Um, I think the pandemic proved that there is a hunger for, 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 for books. When people are um, given the time, uh, books are very much alive. Um, and to me, the, what I wanted to relay mostly in this book is the sense of pride that we should have as, as Latino people, Latinx, Hispanics, whatever you want to call us, all those labels are fine um, as far as I'm concerned, is, is the fact that we have uh, contributed so much. I mean, the uh, the economy of the United States is is hugely bolstered by the Latino people. The uh, if you were just to take the Latino people by, by themselves and consider them a nation, the Latinos here in this country, the Hispanics, uh, it would be the fifth largest GDP in the world. Think about that. It is al already the Latino population is the largest. Spanish-speaking country, nation in itself, other than Mexico. It's larger than Colombia, it's larger than Venezuela, it's larger than, than uh, any, uh, Argentina, Chile, you name it, whatever. We are, we are larger as a people, as a nation, than any of those countries barring Mexico. Uh, we also, um, the history that we have had here, the uh, uh, Latinos have fought in the in the American Revolutionary War. Washington actually said we could not have won this war if the, the Spanish troops that came in from Latin America did not come up and, uh, and uh, sort of force the blockade that um, the British had on the waters and help the rebels to win the Revolutionary War. So w that was, uh, Latinos participated in that, Latinos participated in the Civil War. Every single war that the United States has fought, the Latinos have been a part of it. Uh, in fact, today, 26% of the United States Marine Force is Latino. Wow. One out of four. You know? And it goes all the way back. People, uh, I, ha I don't think, will read in a textbook, in an American textbook, that David Farragut, there's a Farragut Square in Washington, D.C., right? There is a bust of Farragut in the, in the Army-Navy Club in, in D.C. Um, nobody goes by and points to Farragut and says, well, there's a Latino, there's a Latino hero. But David Farragut's family had come from the Canary Islands. He was an absolute Latino. His name was Farragut. 
which is became Farragut to us. And he was the first admiral of the United States Navy, a Latino. So um, this isn't taught in, in schools. And this is, this is my great mission is to, um, to convey this, not only this history, but this presence, this incredible presence. And as you say, and thank you for saying it, Bob, uh, the sense of unity that although, although we may be very, very different in the pockets that we occupy in this country, um, we are quite unified. If you, it, when Trump said that we were rapists or the Mexicans were rapists and criminals and they were all pouring across the border, that alone was unifying to the Latinos. I mean, you, even if you, we say, oh, you know, I'm not exactly like uh, the Salvadorans. I mean, I don't know anything about the Salvadorans or I don't know, uh, you know, I'm really not like them. You say a bad word about a Salvadoran and we're there, we're there. Um, that, that's where you see the unity uh, in these people. And um, it, it's, it's a very strong uh, sense. Well, you know, identity. I'm very conscious in these interviews or discussions. First of all, I'm accused of talking too much and interrupting, but I'm talking to one professional, one professional to uh -huh. another. Uh, and I'm on guard against that. And so I, I did I do want to pick up on what you just said, but I don't want to impose my own bias on this. Uh, but we are living at a time where there's sort of a, a, the emergence of the global South and a, an objection that the decisions should be made in white Europe or Western Europe, the United States, you know, and so forth. And there's a pushback and you have strange not alliances, but like the BRIC alliance and so forth uh, uh, of, uh, you know, I just was talking to a, a young man yesterday from India who was actually born in England and so forth, talking about why Modi in England in India has some appeal, a lot of appeal because of nationalism and, and so forth and manages to get along with others under the, even though when they can't get along with China, but they now get along with sort of a, a whole idea of the South. And and I was reading your book, and there is, I don't want to read into this, but there's an indictment of colonialism and, and uh, oh, yes. a view that what defines Latino land, I should give the title of the book, I'm being remiss here, Latino land, a portrait of America's largest and least understood minority. And I happen to, because I live in L.A. and uh, through intermarriage and everything, I'll, I'll spend the, the, right through the weekend with Oaxacan people in Salvador and so forth and, you know, uh, be the odd person out or at least the, the old gringo here and so forth. And so in L.A., it's really mm -hmm. inescapable that, that we're talking about a majority that is varied but shares something of what you're describing. That's the something I want to get at, because that's what makes it a political force that you have to deal with, which is a sub-theme of the book and why the book is so important. We have to understand this population. And because it's complex, you better read a book that embraces the complexity and tries to parse it so we just don't get in this stupid stereotyping. But whether you cross the border legally or illegally, you know, people from Salvador, most of them came, many of them came in legally because we messed up the politics of their country, so they got exception. Obviously, people from Puerto Rico were always, well, for the longest time, legal, you know, very confusing growing up in the Bronx and recognizing these people have full citizenship. So we never had that kind of papers argument. The Italians were called WAPs without papers uh, when you wanted to be derogatory, but not the Puerto Ricans. They, they had papers. But I want to end our, this discussion really uh, on what is the point, what is this unity? And you just touched on it because it's not voting. It's not religious practice. It's not degree of economic success. It's not skin color. Uh, but to put it crudely, is it uh, anti-colonialist? Is it a recognition that maybe all virtue and uh, significance is not with the dominant Anglo uh, culture here? Yeah, we are survivors of colonialism in a way that the United States of America is not. 
Uh, I don't think anybody looks back and says, oh, the English were really awful. And, you know, nobody's thinking in that terms, in those terms. Um, but we are survivors of colonialism uh, and the, the whole, uh, the, the very rigid um, grid that was put on Latin America by, by the Spanish uh, conquerors. And I think that defines us in a way. It also, we are defined by the failure of so many revolutions. I mean, we won our independence in Latin America, um, uh, but that independence that was promised, which was full equality, um, no slavery, all of that sort of stuff, became very, very complicated. And the laws became very confused because of the different republics, and there was no unity there. Um, I think that the, when you say, what is the unity here, it, is, um, it, it, it really is a celebratory uni unity is the way that I see it, because all, very many things that did not happen that were promised um, when colonialism was sh shoved from the uh, Latin American shores are kind of achieved in this country. Uh, and that's, I think, what the sense of unity that we have as American Latinos is that we've come from a similar past. We are all, you know, uh, uh, initially uh, we were Catholics. We were imposed with Catholicism, let's not forget. We were either imposed with it or we were imposing it. We are, as Mario Vargas Llosa, the great writer, said, you know, both master and slave. Uh, in uh, having been as mixed as we are. But the unity that we have here, um, I think is, uh, comes from a lot of similar ethics. I mean, we, we are a very um, musical people. We are a very cultural people. We appreciate storytelling. We are also um, a, a people who value family. Um, you won't see us straying far from family for a long time. Uh, corporations in this country trying to hire Latinos couldn't get them to leave their families behind and move somewhere else. Um, we are very family bound. Uh, so all of these things, when you look at the, the things politically, I mean, the Republicans and the Democrats are both saying, what's important to Latinos? What We want to get at what, what's important. What's important is work. Jobs our number is number one. Um, then there's a split between Republicans and Democrats on the number two. Number two for, um, for Republicans is security, safety, gun policy for um, uh, the people who lean toward the Democratic side uh, for Latinos. It's education. So there's become the divisions, but the, but the, the work ethic, that sense of, uh, of, of, a, of having a job, we are the least unemployed people in the country. Um, there, we our purchasing power is 3.5 trillion. I mean, it's uh, the economy, the uh, the workplace life of a Latino is is hugely important, and that unites us as well. I think that ethic unites us as well. But um, but yeah, uh, I, I am so grateful, Bob, for your enthusiasm for this book because this is really a mission for me as to to make people aware not only of who we are, but of, of the history of us and the importance of us to the well, welfare of us. Well, let me stress, I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of the book because I think the ideas are very powerful and not properly understood. <laughs> Aside from that, it was a joy to read, uh, and that's not always the case. A book can be very important and really not, I have to keep pinching myself to read it. Your book is the opposite. It's merciful, short, uh, yet very well informed, very well thought out. So it all well, comes from a, a book professional. And, and so I, I really appreciate that. But I, I think the big idea, and again, I don't want to impose, I don't want to co-opt the book. That's a danger in, in what I do here. Uh, but to me, the big idea is this question of American exceptionalism and, and the melting pot, that we have a lock on virtue, that we've become a superior. This is what, and it's not just Donald Trump, it's Joe Biden, it's everybody, you know. Uh, we have the secret sauce. We are the highest, what Ronald Reagan, you know, uh, the city on the hill. We're the highest expression of humanity. And I remember as a kid in the Bronx, 
really being offended by the melting pot notion because I saw things that were interesting about people in my own family. I, like you, come from mixed uh, Jewish, German, Protestant, Russian, right. Jewish, blah, blah, blah. But everybody was kind of like that. And, and I always thought that was a virtue. Their food was different, their attitude, and so forth. That's what we have in Los Angeles now. Let me celebrate Los Angeles. I think we're the greatest city around. And, we're, and also California is also a fifth of the world, you know, fifth largest economy. Or, or so we have all these great cities. But what I like about L.A. is people don't melt as easily as you might think. You know, uh, we have very distinct right. neighborhoods, whether they're Korean or whatever, you know, Chinese, but, uh, you know, and, and different, as you know. Uh, and I, I, I think that your book represents a challenge to that stereotyping of the other. Uh, and, and I think it's time, because particularly as we have this shifting demographic, uh, to not, and, and, and we marginalize people like, your papers or what, how did you get here? Well, come on, that's a story for everybody. I mean, uh, exclusion or inclusion or what have you. But your your book is an introduction to the vibrancy uh, of, of this complex assortment of this, you know, knitting it together. And, and I think that's important. And it's not a question of being politically correct. Uh, there's nothing politically correct about your book. You you show there's a dark side to nationalism, a dark side to people stressing things. And even within a group, there are people who behave well and people who don't behave well and so forth. Uh, but I think maybe that's a good way to wrap this up. Uh, I, again, I don't want to hijack right. the idea, but I think there's a radical insight here. I like that. I like that. I have to say, Bob, you know, as someone who has devoted their lives to my life to, to books, that um, a book is a vehicle between two thinking human beings, you know, and the way that you receive the book, um, when you say, I don't want to co-opt, it's your right to co-opt what I've written. And uh, I think that's a beautiful thing. So, oh. so I like your interpretation. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, you hear that, folks at NPR? I'm not co-opting the book. Okay. So, uh, I want to thank you for doing this. The book is Maria Arana. The book is now out there. It wasn't when I started this. Latino Land: A Portrait of America's Largest and Least Understood Minority. We're heading into an election season where it's already begun about the border, the border, the border. Real border is real. There's a lot of human stuff. But come on, this border has, has broke, if that's the right word, a long time ago. And and we have this reality. Now we have to deal. And, you know, it's sad because in the last lecture we heard about the dreamers and were we going to make it right? Were we going to have decent immigrant reform? And, you know, the old argument, I mean, I always, always believed in uh, what used to be Republican doctrine, uh, making uh, people legal, because then they have rights to join unions, to protect their interests, to have a day in court, uh, claim the, the money that they put into various programs they can also use. I mean, that's an old argument. And the, the Democrats weren't always so wonderful on immigration. Now they, I, I don't know how wonderful they'll be, but this will be a hot issue in the election. So I want to say a Latino land, there could not be a book. Uh, I would put it number one uh, on my list, given how much we're going to be discussing immigration and the immigration issue in this election. This should be number one on what you read uh, for being prepared for the election. Okay. So that's enough praise here, uh, but I, I mean it. Uh, I want to thank Christopher Ho and Laura Kondarajian at uh, the NPR, the great NPR station, KCRW, here in Santa Monica for posting these shows. Joshua Shear, our executive producer. Diego Ramos, who's right now in Chile, uh, who writes the introduction and uh, it represents just this kind of Latino uh, world. Uh, and he's back visiting with his family. He was born here. I want to thank Max Jones, who also has a part Asian in his, even though uh, he he's, seems all white, uh, and for doing the video editing. And I want to thank the JKW Foundation in memory of Gene Stein, the former uh, publisher of Grant Street, an 
important literary publication for providing some funding for this. Uh, so that's it for this session. Uh, see you next week with another edition of Sheer Intelligence. 